Action 52 is one of the most well-known infamous crap games out there in the wild today. Created by Active Enterprises and thrown together by a bunch of college students to save on money, and then shoved out the door at a price point of 200 American dollars on a clear, unlicensed NES cartridge, it's well known just how much Active Enterprises favored quantity over quality. With many of the games playing either very similar to one another or reusing assets from different games, with many of them so poorly coded, they're pretty much impossible to actually play, and a few of them don't even start up normally. Of course, this would be later followed up by the unreleased Cheetah Men 2, a game based entirely around one of the games on the cartridge that Active Enterprises wanted to make into a full-blown franchise. Didn't really work out that way for them. But a lot of people don't seem to know or seem to have forgotten that there was another version of this game, developed for Active by Farsight Technologies. It was yet another unlicensed game and once again cost $200 upon launch and was released on the Sega Genesis. There was a Super Nintendo version planned as well, but that was canned. All the better, I think. So with this game not being as well known as its NES counterpart and consequently being comparatively cheaper than the NES version, that begs the question, is it any better than what came before it? Well, having spent some time with the game and everything it has to offer, I can answer that question with a resounding no. No, it is not. Well, objectively, it is a little bit better, and they at least didn't go with the enhanced port idea, instead making most of the games totally original, with games sporting similar names or graphics to the predecessors being totally remade as well. The game is not completely broken. In fact, pretty much all of the games function as intended, and I've only had one instance of the game crashing on me, and it worked after I restarted. The game also gets a bit more in the presentation department, sporting a much larger and overall much better soundtrack than the original game. The game even goes above and beyond by having the music change for each level of each game. Sure, most of them repeat after a while, but A for effort. Every game consists of nine different levels, getting harder with each one, and you don't really get anything for finishing any of them other than a congratulations screen with your final score. And due to the obscene difficulty of most of them, you won't be getting anywhere near the end. The games are at least arranged nicely on the main menu, with each game color-coded with their difficulty. White is special, yellow is expert, purple is intermediate, green is beginner, and blue is two-player only. Though they kind of screwed that up because all of the expert games are at the beginning of the list and all of the beginners are at the end, but whatever, it doesn't really make much of a difference in the long run. And so to make sure you all get the authentic Action 52 experience, we're going to do what every other reviewer does and rapid fire each of these games and see what makes this thing unique compared to its more famous counterpart. Starting off with Bonkers. Well, immediately I'm impressed. Someone went out of their way to make a title screen for this game, with probably one of the most disturbing faces I've ever seen on a Genesis cartridge. But you know what? It's actually a decent reflex-based puzzle game. You start off as a green ball and have to clear all of the colored bricks in each level, and then get rid of all of the green dot bricks after that. You change colors by hitting a color key block, but you can't go back to green after you change colors. So if you've still got green bricks to break, well, you gotta die. Your ball also does not stop bouncing up and down, so you need to time it to make sure you don't hit any of the instant death bricks scattered in each level. This is actually a fairly decent puzzler, at least until you hit level 3, where it all kind of falls apart. The jump in difficulty here is staggering and makes the game feel really unfair. Moving left and right is responsive, but it's way too sensitive for you to guide yourself accurately through tight spaces. It's a shame because it had a promising start and then it all went to hell. Kinda like the rest of this cartridge, actually. Dark Sign. A single screen shooter where you're tasked with picking up power-ups and shooting enemies. This one would be okay if it didn't operate off of Asteroids logic. You can rotate and fire all you want, but you have to fire thrusters in order to move, and touching anything at all, from the enemies to the walls, is an instant death, and dying means restarting the level from the beginning. And because it's based around some form of physics, you never have total control over the speed and direction with which you're moving, meaning you are totally helpless the moment you start to drift. The enemy firing speed and pattern also appears to be random, just for another layer of annoyance. Dino Tennis one of the few scattered two-player games. 
It's basically just a game of Pong, as you play a dinosaur smacking a caveman back and forth. It's passable, but definitely nothing that will keep you engaged for long, and most of the sprites and backgrounds have a really weird perspective going on, which will be a recurring theme for the collection. Ooh's. One of the most infamous games from the original collection, due to a botched cash prize contest associated with it, this game is not much better than the original. I'm sure you can actually finish this one if you're patient enough, but they changed it from a basic move right and shoot platformer to a search the room platformer, where you need to collect all the keys and make your way to the exit, wherever that might be. You can actually jump properly in this one, but you cannot attack at all while in the air, a bit of a problem when enemies are often above or below you. The hitboxes also suck, as even getting near these crushers is a death sentence. Starball. It's pinball, and a very basic one at that. There's at least a lot going on on the table, and it actually seems to have some decent ball physics, but it's not exactly unique. Sidewinder. You ever play Afterburner? Here's a worse version of it. You need to shoot down a certain number of enemies to progress, but when they appear, where they will appear, and how many feels totally random. And when I played, I always felt like I was either staring at nothing for minutes at a time, or there were way too many missiles on screen for me to actually shoot at anything. You can also scroll left and right and scroll the screen up and down a bit, but that just makes the game last longer because it means enemies could be approaching from any direction, and it also means that the annoying missile alerts could be for a missile that's not going anywhere near you, since things that are behind or off screen don't really exist. Daytona. A very boring pole position clone. Functional, but boring. I already don't like racing games like this, so the fact that this one is already a mediocre version of a rather bare-bones game doesn't do it any favors. The sound effects are also terrible, especially when you're turning a corner, and the pixelated digitized car model that they use for you and your opponents really clashes with the very basic environments on each side of the road. Fifteen Puzzle A very generic sliding puzzle where you watch the puzzle shuffle itself and then try to reshuffle it so that the panels 1 through 15 are all in their proper order. I don't even like sliding puzzles in real life, so what makes you think I'd like it here? Sketch It's... it's a drawing pad. Yep, this sure is a drawing pad. This took up one of the slots for a game on this $200 cartridge. Huh. Star Duel. Another two-player game. Once again, you have asteroid controls and you can move freely wherever you want and can even go off screen to come out the other end. All you do is try to shoot down your opponent before they shoot you down. This one actually looks like it might be some goofy fun if you actually have someone to play with, but it won't last long as there is no variety to it. It's just you and your opponent, no other obstacles, no other stages. You just shoot each other down in the void of space. How sad. Haunted Hills. Well, isn't this a surprise? It's a proper platforming game with proper platforming levels. Kind of. It shares the same sort of gameplay with Ooze. You're a nameless guy armed with a torch and need to collect all of these... things. What are they, Twitch bits? Let's go with Twitch bits. And then you're whisked away to the next level. It's basic, but a little bit better than Ooze. But your attack range is pathetically short, and it doesn't take long before having to scour an entire level to collect all the bits gets really old, especially when you're constantly forced to the edge of the screen and enemies can ambush you at any second. Alfredo. You're a chef in front of a giant pot. Avoid the sausages and meatballs and try to grab the pasta that flies out. You move rather slow compared to how fast the objects can move and bounce around, and because you can never be sure when or where something is going to pop out of the pot, it is impossible to effectively dodge anything that comes near you or grab anything that you want to. Also, there's barely any animation to the pot itself, things just sort of seem to appear from nowhere as they hop out towards you. The Cheetah Men the headliners of the last game have now been turned into... basically another clone of Haunted Hills and Ooze. A lot of the same problems there, too. You can't attack while jumping, your attack has a terrible range, and you have an annoyingly large hitbox, and you can't even reliably tell when you're going to walk into an enemy or not. Add in a bunch of stuff in the foreground that can block your view, and you're not going to get far in this one. The idea is to find and release all the baby cheetahs from their cages, but I don't even think I managed to get past the first level on this one, despite my best efforts. Skirmish. 
Again, two player only. And at first, I had hopes for this one as it appears to be some form of strategy game. You pick from several different maps and then each player takes turns setting down a couple of units that they want to use, each with different armor, speed, and attack. When two opposing units meet, they fight. Unfortunately, it's basically just a glorified version of the game Combat from Atari. I appreciate the effort, but it doesn't really amount to a whole lot. Depth Charge You play as a battleship dropping depth charges on subs underneath you. You can move left and right, but you are always at the very top of the screen, atop the water. It's basically a horizontal scrolling shooter where you have limited involvement and attack options. Subs can be stationary or they can move, some will attack and others won't, but whether or not they do and how quick is totally up to chance. Which, believe me, is really annoying when they are so close to the edge of the water that they're basically right under your sub. It gets impossible on later levels, another running theme in this collection. Mind's Eye, or as most people would know it, Minesweeper. It's just Minesweeper. It's okay, but if I wanted Minesweeper, I'd just play Minesweeper. Next. Alien Attack. You run to the right and shoot stuff. Actually, scratch that shooting part, you probably won't. Sometimes enemies run right past you, other times they'll come in at an angle and try to follow you. You can beat the first few levels by just holding right and spamming fire, but after that, good luck. Anything that runs straight is too fast to reliably kill, and every enemy takes at least two shots. And anything that comes in at an angle might move slower, but will already be so close to you that dodging or killing it will be a feat in and of itself, especially when the screen gets flooded by all these monsters. Billabob! First person shooting gallery on the Genesis with a D-pad, how could this fail? At the very least, the hitboxes work in your favor this time, as you don't have to be right on top of the enemies to actually hit them, but even in the early levels, with how slow your crosshair moves and how many enemies you're attacked with at once, it's just a matter of time before you're whittled down to nothing. Also at this point, I'm sure you've noticed, but the games keep using all of the same stock sound effects as well. While each game may look relatively unique, though graphical assets are going to start reappearing en masse before too long, the screams and grunts and explosions and gasps and everything else has been reused since game one, and it's starting to get a little distracting. Bit of a bad thing because we're only on game 19. Sharks. You're a scuba diver shooting sharks. You can't move off of the screen and sharks will approach from either the left or the right and you shoot them. Shoot enough sharks to advance. It's pretty boring, and the game is basically dependent on how often the sharks actually show up, which is randomly determined. So you could end up either getting swarmed or have obscene amounts of downtime. And look how sluggish your character moves. The entire game feels far more slower paced than it should. Knockout. Two-player boxing game, where all you do is jab at your opponent and hope you hit them. You can move back and forth and also jump obscenely high in the air, which is pretty damn useless since you can't attack in the air, and it doesn't even help in getting away from your opponent since you don't have a lot of horizontal movement. Intruder Make your way through an electrified maze while dodging robots that can move through the walls. You can shoot them, but because of how big a target you are, chances are good they'll hit you on the toe and then you'll die. Hell, you barely fit through some of these hallways, and touching the sides is a death sentence. What's more, it is actually a maze with dead ends and useless paths, and if you get caught in one, you have to slowly walk your way back to another fork and find the right way to go. This is also the first game to actively hurt my eyes, as I find this game's color palette in particular to be very unpleasant for some reason. Echo! Echo. Simon Says. It's a version of Simon Says. Game makes some beeps and blips and you copy it. Very slowly. The levels in this game take four freaking ever, and it's mind-numbing to an incredible degree. Let's move on while I still have gray matter left. Freeway. Another one-screen game. You play as a dog running across traffic to grab their toys from one side of the freeway and bring them back to the other side without getting run over, with the number of toys and the amount and speed of the traffic increasing from level to level. This one isn't bad, honestly. It's no masterpiece, but it's a decent game on its own. But I find it very upsetting considering what happens to the dog when he dies. That's just nasty. Why would you do that, Active Enterprises? Mousetrap. 
Not a conversion of the classic wacky board game, much to my disappointment. You're a mouse, and you run around grabbing all the cheese while avoiding the cats. Incredibly simple, but impossible to do well because you can never be sure where the cats will come from either side. And since the cheese can be positioned right next to the sides of the screen, there's a good chance you'll just be sniped before you even realize you're in danger. Ninja. You hold right, and then you win. Seriously, for about the first four levels of this game, you don't even have to jump or attack, as the enemies in this game don't have contact damage. Rather progressive for this time, I suppose, but makes for a pretty boring game. Now, once enemies start coming from behind and actively throwing stuff at you, you do have to start jumping, but it's totally possible to clear this game without attacking once. Slalom. What if Ski Free wasn't fun? You get this game. And there's not even a yeti at the end to eat the player. Yet again, I am disappointed. Also, the game is a boring scrolling game where you just avoid trees until the level arbitrarily ends. Again, theme of the cartridge. In scrolling games, there is never any indication about how close you are to finishing the level. No finish line or anything, and in games where you have to kill or defeat a certain amount of enemies, you aren't even given a counter or anything, so you don't know if you're making any sort of progress. Dauntless. The worst horizontal shooter ever. The clouds are both in the background and the foreground, and because of how frequently they're in your way, it is impossible to tell where enemies are coming from and if they're shooting at you. Plus, enemies will come from behind and shoot at you from behind, but you have no ability to counter that. You'll be lucky to make it past level 1. This color coding scheme means frickin' nothing. Force 1. A horizontal space shooter, incredibly generic. That's really all there is to say about this one. It does have some enemies that just can't be killed that are a constant obstacle to you, but that's the only unique thing about this game. It even reuses a lot of the starship designs from other games on the cart, and the invincible enemy reminds me very heavily of enemies from Galaxian, which I really wish I was playing right now instead. In fact, let's do that. Let's play Galaxian instead. I'm not very good at Galaxian. Spidey! The same gameplay as Mousetrap, except you're a spider trying to grab all the flies on the web. Except that the enemies can come from any direction this time, meaning that spending any time near the edge of the screen is a death sentence. The touchy controls also don't help, as the spider moves too quickly to be controlled with finesse, but if you did move any slower, you wouldn't be able to dodge the enemies effectively. In fact, you can barely dodge them effectively now, when they start moving a lot faster. Appleseed. You're a surly farmer and you gotta grab the red apples while avoiding the green ones. Not gonna lie, this one is actually kinda fun. Well, at first it's boring, but most of these games are insultingly boring and easy at first, but this one actually does get good a couple of levels in where the apples start to fall faster and at an angle. Nice to see something decent now and then, or maybe my sense of taste and quality has just gone down since I've started playing this. Street Skater. You play a skater, boy! She said, see you later, boy! <coughs> mm. Sorry. Anyway, you play a skating kid rolling down the street, collecting boom boxes and avoiding beach balls and a bunch of dead cats. It's boring and monotonous and feels pretty much like all the other randomly generated scrolling games. Next. Sunday Driver. A vertical scrolling game where you avoid traffic coming towards you. It's boring and monotonous and feels pretty much like all the other randomly generated scrolling games. Next. Star Evil. Another one that got translated from the original NES game, and it shows. This might be one of the lazier games on this cart, as it takes place entirely in a single stage for every level. The layout is always the same, and it even loops on itself as you play it, only moving on to the next level after you kill a certain amount of enemies. The only difference is how fast the stage moves and how fast the enemies move. By the time it gets too fast, you've already traveled through the same layout so many times that you're perfectly capable of predicting where you need to go, with the only hiccup being where the enemies randomly spawn and move to. Air Command These names are getting pretty generic here. You're a giant plane moving from the top of the screen to the bottom and you shoot down enemies on the way. 1942 this isn't, with the planes you're fighting spawning randomly. And you're so big and slow of a target that it's difficult to evade any attacks. 
If this game were more competent and clever, I'd make a crack about how you're the bad guy, seeing as how you're moving from the top of the screen, but this game doesn't deserve that dignity. Shootout. It's a shooting gallery game where you need to shoot all the cute animals before you run out of bullets. Again, this is one of the easier games. You can move the gun left and right, but you're always aiming at what seems to be a bottom lane. The perspective makes it look like you shoot at the bottom, and then the bullet suddenly swerves upwards towards the top lane, rather than there being any sort of depth of field or distance. It's disorienting. But really all you have to do is time and lead your shots when the animals pass by on the bottom lane, and the game quickly becomes pretty boring. Bombs Away you're an inordinately tall guy running through some village that's being bombed, and boy is it amateur hour in this game. You can jump, but there's no reason to do so because there's no obstacle on the ground and jumping puts you at risk from the bombs falling from above. At least the perspective is proper as you and the bombs run behind the buildings, but they're so large that running behind them actually makes it more likely you'll be hit by the bombs. Also, the bombs don't actually land, they just pass through the ground, which looks especially silly when they go behind a building and then pass through the bottom. Home stretch. we're in the green games now. Speedboat. Insert my criticisms about Sunday Driver here, which was basically the same criticism about every other vertical scrolling game on this cartridge. Basically the same game, except you're in a speedboat and there are at least more kinds of obstacles to avoid, but again, same game, different skin. Dead Ant. Yet another game from the original cart, and somehow this one was made worse. You can't move from one side of the screen to the other, a la Pac-Man, like you could in the original. The enemies spawn and move randomly, and while you can move all over the screen yourself, the size of you and the enemies makes it difficult to actually dodge anything. What's more, one of the randomly spawning enemies is an invincible spider beast that stays around until you either die or beat the level, and you could have as many as five of these things spawning at once. G-Force Fighters Now we're really getting into them recycling a lot of the old games. This one even looks similar to the NES version, and it plays just as bad. It's a very generic horizontal space shooter, with the same sort of annoying quirks as the others, with enemies that spawn behind you and fire randomly. At the very least, you can see what you're doing in this one, so there's that. Man at Arms You're a lone defender atop a castle wall, and you have to fire arrows at oncoming invaders. If any of them reach the wall, you lose. That's it. Because again, the invaders spawn randomly, and you don't exactly move like lightning, it can be very easy to get overwhelmed, until you realize that every invader takes one hit to kill, and you can just fire and step and fire and step quickly, and suddenly the game becomes incredibly boring and trivial. Norman. You're a tank on a single screen shooting other tanks and enemies with all of the assets reused from Skirmish. Your tank also dies in one hit from anything, even the comically large soldiers. And again, because of the erratic and random enemy movement and the fact that you're a pretty damn big target, you aren't going to be able to do well in this one. Armor Battle. It's combat. That's all it is, it's just combat. Two-player game combat. I wonder if they could get any more blatant, he said, totally not setting himself up for later. Magic Bean. You're Jack, and you're climbing a beanstalk as things from the giant's house rain down on you. It's like all the other vertical scrollers, except in this one you have less room to maneuver, as you can't go beyond the edges of the beanstalk. There is one positive in this game's favor, however. Rather than the levels just abruptly ending, they only end when you actually reach the giant's house at the very top of the beanstalk. And I'm only praising that because so few other games on this cart actually have this little touch. It's notable enough to be called out. Apache Vertical shooter, where the only notable thing about it is the fact that you're a helicopter this time. Same complaints, can you tell I'm running out of distinct vitriol yet? Paratrooper. Same gameplay as Mousetrap and Spidey, with the big difference being that you can actually shoot, and there are actually obstacles in your way you have to navigate around to grab all of these computer chip things. You also move a lot slower than in those games, but that just makes the game more boring, as now the levels seem to drag on forever rather than ending in the blink of an eye. Still just as easy to die, though. Sky Avenger you're a helicopter moving from right to left and blowing up planes and blimps while flying through the same assets as in Bombs Away. 
You can even duck behind the buildings in the foreground, which again makes it really tough to know if anything is in your way. That must be one tiny helicopter too, or we're in the land of the giants. Sharpshooter. You're a guy in a shooting gallery shooting at randomly spawning, randomly moving things. One moment it's bunnies, the next it's big pink Nami faces. At least some of the other games had some measure of artistic cohesion, but this one, not so much. It's also pretty damn easy, since you only die if something touches you at the bottom of the screen, but due to the way the enemies move, if they get down there, you're pretty much screwed. Meteor. The most boring, brain-dead, easiest game on the entire cartridge. One of the few games that actually gives you a rapid-fire feature, and you fire so rapidly that merely moving back and forth along the bottom of the screen makes you an unstoppable god of death. And despite there being a city behind you, there is no penalty at all for letting the meteor simply fly by you. Out of all of the games on this cart, this is the only one that you can, hands down, beat without a problem. Even Ninja at least forced me to jump now and then, and think about what I was doing. Black Hole. You're a ship, which is also an enemy ship used in other space games, shooting at other ships while the background around you shifts about uncomfortably. Seriously, it's actually really disorienting the way the static black and blue background just shakes like that. It's also the only notable thing about this game, considering that it's yet another underwhelming vertical scrolling shooter where your ship is too big of a target compared to everything else you're shooting at. The Boss. A single screen game where you run around as an anthropomorphic lizard and collect money while shooting other gangsters and cops. Again, not a lot to this one, and the only stupid thing about it is that it's really hard to get on and off of these damn ladders. Even when you're perfectly level with the ground, it seems random whether or not you can actually get off. And since you can't attack while on the ladder, it's really easy to get killed if the floor you're on gets covered with enemies. First game. The last multiplayer game. It's Pong. It's just Pong, all black and white and stuff. They wasted a game slot on Pong. Even though it is probably the most competent game in this entire collection, I am still flabbergasted that they decided to include this in the game. And the final game in the entire collection is Challenge. It's not even a game of its own. Instead, you are challenged to play through the hardest level of all the single-player games in a random order. Given how unbalanced some of them are, it is a bit of an impossibility and basically makes the advertisement of 52 games a lie. Well, we all knew that was already the case when we came across Sketch. So if you can't tell, the game isn't good. Is it better than the NES game? Yes, but that's not exactly a high bar to jump, and really the best compliment you can offer the Genesis version is the fact that it's functional. But that comes with a lot of its own problems. A lot of these games aren't actually designed, instead relying on random chance to determine enemy spawns at game speed, meaning that your enjoyment and the challenge is also up to chance. Many of the games are so simplistic that they don't hold your interest for very long, many of them just using the same gameplay as others, just with changes to aesthetics, and a surprisingly low number of them don't even use the buttons, instead exclusively relying on the D-pad for their gameplay. And of course, as I've pointed out, every game, if it has anything memorable about it at all, it's usually memorable for the wrong reasons. So while it is a better game than the NES version, it's still not good, and I wouldn't give any of these games the time of day if not for morbid curiosity. If you're at all interested in this game, emulate it. I don't care what issues you have with emulation, but there is no way you could justify paying upwards of $50 for an okay condition, physical copy of something like this. And if you're the type of person who would drop money on something terrible simply to say you own something terrible, well, more power to you, I suppose, but I'll spend my money on a game I actually want to play for a lot less. Or go out and buy groceries. That's pretty important. I'll see you all next time, everyone. Ah.